year's 10th Visiting Scholars of Color series. Uh, we had already three exciting presentations by Wilder, uh, Bristol, and uh, Scott, who look at a variety of the history of uh, in colleges, of policy, of teachers mm. of color. And I think today uh, we're coming to a part where we're not just looking on kind of how to research diversity at issue, but also on how we can think of putting this into practice, because after all, we don't want to just kind of, we need to understand what the challenges and issues are, but we also need to kind of develop uh, agendas of action and figure out on how we can change the situation. And there, I think there's no better speaker than <laughs> my friend and colleague Robin uh, Chapman to talk about. This was a very interesting and unexpected trajectory because she actually has three degrees in computer science and normally we don't really think about these people <laughs> as uh, uh, being particularly uh, uh, sensitive to diversity issues as everybody know. But I think Robin, uh, more than anybody else, has actually worked on the research and design side, uh, trying to understand how we can address issues and design systems which are more inclusive. And I'll tell you something which you can <coughs> find in her bio, and now I know uh, Robert, that her dissertation, which she worked on at the MIT Media Lab, was actually focused on the Computer Clubhouse, which is a community technology center network where mostly used in underserved communities had an opportunity to engage creatively with technology. So it wasn't about you know, doing homework, playing games, or learning some networking professional skills. It was really just kind of more open-ended. And she designed, she researched and designed a system which she called Pearls of Wisdom uh, to get uh, the members of this clubhouse to share their tech expertise with each other within uh, the center, but also through the network. And I think this is a great example on how uh, we can uh, design systems and interventions uh, that also provide, uh, put agency back into underserved fields who usually not considered the fountain of wisdom for technology. <laughs> So we actually then collaborated on a book, uh, The Computer Clubhouse, which kind of preceded the whole maker movement, <coughs> it's a, a global network of over 100 places, uh, started by at MIT, supported by Intel and many other organizations, to bring together on what it actually takes to kind of create these communities. And then Robin uh, did something more unexpected. Uh, she turned around and became an administrator first uh, at MIT, the manager of diversity efforts, and then for the last uh, seven or eight years at Wells State oh, College, six, but yeah. uh, where she was the uh, associate uh, vice provost for uh, diversity. And I think uh, it's a kind of very interesting shift to move uh, out of the world of research and design uh, uh, into a one of kind of policy and practice and figure out on how we can change in higher education uh, the lack of diversity of underrepresented group. Uh, Robin always jokes when she finished her PhD <laughs> at the media lab, uh, uh, the percentage of uh, students of color dropped immediately by 30%. <laughs> to give you an idea what's going yeah. on. So I, I'm very pleased that she is here to conclude this year's uh, series to provide us with her pearls of wisdom uh, on how uh, we can think about cultivating a practice of mindful leadership. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, Yasmin and I have known each other a long time. So if there's anything you want to know, no. just check over. <laughs> I know all and I have proof. So, no, just kidding, just kidding. But um, yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. And one of the reasons I was really excited um, when I was invited to come and talk about this particular topic, this is a topic that I have um, not just talked about, but done work with mostly at the senior level, um, college and university presidents, boards, um, senior staff, that kind of thing is when I usually do this work. 
Uh, not this particular talk, but this kind of work. How do you cultivate? What is mindful leadership? What do you use it for? How, what does it look like? <clears throat> but I was really excited that this was going to be for an audience of leaders, because you all are, whether you realize it or not, it's just in different ways. Um, and also be able to use that agency around leadership to hopefully affect some change, whatever it is you feel needs to be shifted, um, whether it's in the classroom where you teach, uh, whether it's in the office you work in, whether it's in the research lab, whether it's in the neighborhood, you know, like whatever it is. These are actually life skills. And actually, this particular topic is part of a syllabus that I think of it as a syllabus of five topics that um, I think to have minimal baseline capacity as a community in engaging across um, different kinds of individuals, backgrounds, perspectives, etc. cetera. Um, there are several others. Uh, one is unconscious bias, which I'm going to slip in there today a little bit. Um, another is micro-messaging. The other one is understanding privilege and systems of privilege and how they work. Um, there's mindfulness, and I said there were five, but I combined one. I, the other one will bubble up and I'll let you know when I think of it. But um, <clears throat> I, made sure, I made sure at MIT where I actually had two roles eventually. First I was working with the entire School of Architecture and Planning, but then I ended up working with the entire institute when I worked in the provost's office with faculty at the entire institute. And so that taught me a lot. I was a little bumpy, got a little mangled up, but they made good progress. Uh, and then I went to Wellesley, where my role as associate provost and academic director for the college was over the whole college. And it was a, you know, it was a senior position, so I was able to go in at all levels, trustees and onward, to have people thinking about this as a community, because it looks different depending on what your role is and what your resources, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> here's basically the reality. Uh, it hasn't changed. Every year I update this by one year. So. But the fact is, these kinds of environments, these campuses, these academic environments, these universities, really are one of the few places left so far in the world where people from a huge range and variety of backgrounds and every possible identity you can imagine um, that are, that's different, all get together, right, with a common purpose of some kind. This is an academic institution. Um, and, you know, it's like almost like a big bowl. You threw everyone in there. However, there's this rumor going around that, of course, just because you happen to be thrown into this group, by some magical, mystical process, you automatically know how to make the most of that engagement, or so how to even approach and engage in the first place, how to be resilient if you make a mistake in the engagement, and et cetera. And so, of course, that is a myth, but people will talk about building communities and bringing people together as if people actually know how to be together, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and then again, another additional reality that's important is to think about how campuses are not monolithic. We tend to think of groups, whether it's a campus community, all oh, those MIT people, I hear that one a lot, right? Um, whether it's a group, whatever the identity is, could be gender, could be race, could be absolutely anything, um, that they're just like all act in concert the same way. And of course, that doesn't make any sense. One of the ways that I see this and really <clears throat> make sure, I'm at the Harvard Kennedy School now as a, this is my second week, so, as an associate dean of the school, and actually um, for the Asian student population in pretty much every school in the United States, they, they think of students, when I say they, I think people who are thinking what are we doing for our different groups of students as this monolithic block, and it's like one of the most diverse groups of the groups that they look at. And so at Wellesley College, part of the work we did was to make sure, first of all, we figured out, we did our homework, what all the different ethnicities were for Asian students. And um, even nationally, we don't capture data in this way. And you know, of course, they survey. They love the survey at Wellesley, and students answer them. So um, the students are actually happy to provide that information. They're like, oh my goodness, you're actually seeing me. 
And then when we looked across the data, we realized there were huge differences by ethnicity or by other things in combination with that. And we were able to begin addressing those things um, in, a, in a more systematic way and in a more nuanced way. So anytime you think you're looking at a monolithic group, I can guarantee you, you're wrong. And your sort of curiosity and inquisitiveness hat should pop on. Um, this statement here, if you don't take away anything else today from anything I said, this is the most important thing to take away. And effective engagement, the possibility, productive engagement, fill in a, a nice adjective before that, happens at <coughs> identity intersections. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. In fact, I'll have you practice a little bit too. I'm going to put you to work. So, and any change you're going to make needs to happen at that intersections. And what that means is you need to notice that they exist. And we'll talk about what intersections are in a minute. But um, just sort of emblazon this on your brain while we're here. Okay, so this is really important. Engaging across difference, whatever that is, is just never a neutral act. People think uh, so when I teach, I, I was an education faculty at Wellesley, and I would teach one class a year. And when I would teach, you know, I never for a moment thought that the fact that I had a physical presence in the room, everyone in this room who teaches, everyone in this room that attends class, when you go into that classroom, you are impacting, it's almost like the, the frequency of the energy is being, is a synergy of everybody in that class. It can never be neutral. And when I'm working with my faculty, they would like to say, well, you know, no, no, I go in and I treat everyone the same. I said, you know, even if you went in and just stood there, you are impact, there's, there's things happening for everyone in that class. So, you know, just like, you know, teaching, leading, or engaging can never be a neutral act. And so this is important, what we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes, because then you can begin to notice um, things that will help you not make the mistake of thinking that it's neutral. So why mindfulness? <clears throat> well, first of all, you know, I'm sorry, I meant to ask you all this. Um, before we even go into this, so why'd you come today? Why did you come? Not just for the food. I hope, I hope not just for the food. Maybe not just for me, but I won't be upset if you say that. Um, why, why did you bother to even show up? Oh, yeah. Find out about some best practices, mm -hmm. diversity. Okay, some best practices, hoping to pick up some stuff. Yeah. I do research on mindfulness, but we're teachers, so I was excited mm. to hear talk about leaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, teach, I um, teach about mindfulness in my class, which is a learning technologies class. So. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a design class, and they need to be mindful if they're doing that. Anyone else? Why did you decide to come? It's not a test, by the way. I was interested in learning more about your experiences and uh, challenges at institutions uh, mm -hmm. with topics related to diversity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of reasons, and there's probably more, and you should feel free to shout it out, or, you know, I can always back up to that. Mindfulness is, I think of it this way. Um, there's different vocabulary to use, but I think of it as a way for me to have uh, an increased nuanced focus, not just on what's around me and what's happening, but also an inward focus for what's happening with me and a better understanding of myself, because my being there is not a neutral situation. Um, I've also found that it helps you to begin to see things that were previously not as noticeable. So your awareness increases drastically. Now, any of you later can Google, or talk to the expert here, can, <laughs> can Google or whatever YouTube, as my nephew would say, um, around mindfulness to get some background and also some practicing to see what that means. But it's almost like, it's kind of like taking the red pill, if, you, if you've seen the Matrix movie. It's like once you've done it, you can't go back to not noticing. Your level and depth of awareness increases. The things you notice, it's like all of a sudden you're noticing details just 
you just didn't see them before, they weren't there. Um, with some practice, you also learn how to have the kind of flexibility that allows you to be resilient, and it also allows you to be able to hear and see all of a person um, or all of a situation in a way that is not um, permanently tied to your own perspective and your own way of thinking or whatever your cultural background is. And it gives you a kind of focus um, that is more razor sharp, because you may have razor sharp already, than you currently have. You can really, in a situation, be able to focus in on the thing that's important to be getting information about at the moment. And usually we're all, I love doing this when I'm in meetings, especially, you know, meetings where, you know, it's going to be a little, a little dicey. And it actually helps navigate those meetings, this sort of mindful way of engaging with the space and everyone that's there. So why use it? And actually, I had to have at least one quote, uh, one of John's quotes. But you're paying attention in a particular way. Um, on purpose, so it's very intentional, and you're going to hear me use the word intentional a lot. You're in the moment, so you're not projecting what you think it means or what you think is going to happen. You're actually paying attention. It's hard to do in the beginning because I like to solve things. <laughs> so it's hard to not do that. And non judgmentally, so what that means is you're doing it in a way where you're as flexible as possible. Right? Now, that was easy to read. That's really hard to do. And it takes practice. It's the kind of thing you will gain fluency with if you practice. But we're going to um, practice in a minute. Not mindfulness, but something that I think may help um, a little bit. But I did say at the beginning, noticing intersections. So I should actually say what that is. Kimberly Crenshaw's work, or, you know, a foundational work. There have been other people since then. But when you think about intersections, it's really around your identity. So each of us, um, I've had a lot of my students, particularly my wife students, say, oh, but I'm not diverse. I don't have diversity. And I'm like, you're right. Mm -hmm. That would be impossible because diversity is a measurement term. And one person, <laughs> you need at least two people to be able to talk about something like, you know, that distribution of that measurement. You just, so you're right. Or they're not. Neither am I. But what we all are comprised of are many different identities, most of which are invisible to the people we engage with, right? So it could be gender, it could be my religion, it could be am I married or not, it could be, you know, am I a singer, it could be almost anything. But there is a collection of identities that for each of you is really important. Like it's, it's who you think makes you who you are and unique. And um, we won't do this today because it's not a whole workshop. But doing some exercises around that um, is important. So if you look up identity wheel or something like that, and if you don't find something, you let me know and I'll send something. She's already like making a face. Um, you know, it's good to practice doing that because what will happen is you will think of a number of identities that are important. Like right off the bat, you'll think of some. In fact, I'll just ask, what's an important identity um, to you? What's one of your identities that you think? Being a woman. Being a woman. Okay. What about you? Being a parent. Being a parent. Okay. And what about, well, this is good, it's like you're calling on people. What about you? <laughs> uh, being black. <laughs> being black. Right. That's right. And what, oh, Laura? A being a veteran. Exactly. So, I mean, there are so many that we can't see, some we can and so many that you would never understand are important. And so when you're engaging with people, you don't have to know that list, because that would be really hard, but you have to know there is a list for that person. And doing the exercise will help you get it down to a shorter, um, more precise list, uh, or more true, truthful list, <laughs> I should say. But um, around intersectionality, this is just a, my very bad artwork showing a person who I call Susan, who has two identity dimensions that at the moment for her are important. One is that she's a yellow dot, 
And unfortunately for her, there, there, there's a pressure <coughs> system that work around her yellow dotness, right? And one is that she's a green circle. And unfortunately, that's in a similar situation. Two different identities, both of which um, are not privileged identities. Then there's Tanya. Tanya also has yellow dots, so she experiences oppression around that characteristic. But Tanya's also an orange circle. She's not a green circle. So being an orange circle is great. They're the best. They're better than all the other circles, whatever. So what do you think happens when there's some work that has to be done um, around bringing about equity for yellow dots that these two circles, these two women, well, their names are female, as I said it, are doing together? So whoops, whoops. So one is an orange dot, and it's a privilege. I mean, an orange circle. And the other is a green circle, which is not a privilege. What do you imagine might happen over time or during their engagement? They thought I was just going to talk. <laughs> they said lecture, so no. No, just, just what you think. There's no, don't worry, it's not a test. What do you think might happen? Yeah. What's your name? Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if the orange circle would start to kind of suppress in her yellow dotness and kind of amp up her orange circleness, and so that mm -hmm. becomes kind of her dominant identity because it gives her some leverage. And mm -hmm. um, even though she's got some connection with Susan, right. who's got yellow dotness, she might not know that because she plays up her her other her orange circle. <laughs> her <laughs> orange. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, that excellent. Anyone else? Any other one? Well, at least when they're together, they bond over their yellow mm -hmm. dotness. Uh -huh. Yeah. So when they're together, they bond over this. Mm -hmm. But it could be that something could happen That's later. True. Yeah. I, I, I can see the uh, orange dots having the green dots. She's too sensitive about her green Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So there could be some not some, quite some, so hearing that, yeah. or listening kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I equate, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, I was going to say the yellow dot, the <laughs> Tanya mm -hmm. might see the commonality in the yellow dots. Right. Let's say we're just the same, mm -hmm. and whoever the green circle was, mm -hmm. so Susan. Susan, might say, hey, we're not the same. We have this other different. Our circles are different. Yeah. Our big circles are different. OK, all three of you are absolutely correct. And that's saving me a slide, which is great. And so essentially, you're right. And I equate this, um, I'll give you an a real life example. The women's movement back in the 60s, right? In the 60s, I didn't say it like that, but <laughs> back then, in the 60s. In the women's movement, it was, you know, women, yellow dots, getting together, making it happen, right? And so, and things were happening, but when it became time for policy or for um, negotiation or for things like that to happen, they're, they're, it turned out that the things that were enacted were the things that the orange circles, because they were listened to, they had a voice, they had privilege and sometimes used that privilege to silence the voice of green circles. There was all kinds of stuff, but it ended up that a lot of the things that were put in place benefited were almost custom made to benefit this combination and not this combination, right? And so that's why seeing the intersection, seeing the pieces are so important because noticing that makes what is an invisible identity. So what happens is the thing they fear it became very visible, but it was decided to just not really, that's not really an issue, we're all women, right? But being a, a green woman with yellow or whatever is really different from being an orange woman with yellow dots. So it also um, helps you notice more things about the groups of people you're working with. It, in a way, it gives you permission to be inquisitive, to find out, to, to learn more, to do your own homework when you do that, by the way. And also, that's important. And then consider the ways that discrimination occurs simultaneously across identities. So discrimination for both of these conditions occurs at the same time. It's a different formula. The muffin's gonna be different than this other muffin once you bake it up. It's just different, right? 
Now, it doesn't mean that they can't work together at all. As a matter of fact, I think it's even more of a reason for them to work together. Because if everyone is just noticing and paying attention and you know, making very transparent what those relationships are, some of the ideas or some of the techniques or some of what came out of that movement might have been different in a way that would have benefited a broader range of women. So that's just a concrete example. It was important that the movement happened, but you know, we'll get more bang for our buck next time because the revolution will be televised. Okay. So, um, and it also helps us by doing this work together, like really being transparent. It means that Tanya will probably have to increase on her understanding of the relation of the big circle identity to social systems, right? And so it's just, it's all part of us really understanding um, how perspective and uh, changes according to our identity structure. Now, every single, like in me, I might have a hundred different identities. They're not all salient at any given time, right? It depends on what's going on. If I'm, if I'm in France, the fact that I only speak one language suddenly becomes an important part of my identity, right? So it's context sensitive. So that's something to also think about as well. So why did I go on and on and on about that? It was sort of to prepare you to start thinking about, well, mindful, mindfulness and leadership. And I use that word on purpose. I didn't say mindfulness in teaching. I didn't say mindfulness in you know, babysitting or whatever. I said leadership. Because as far as I can tell, I'm looking at a room full of leaders. You lead in different ways at different times and in different contexts. But at some point, every single one of you will take a leadership position in some small or big way. And it doesn't have to be an official or positional one. It could be, you know, during the civil rights, the, the boycott, making sure that you make as many sandwiches as possible so people can have food because now they're walking instead of, there's all, that's what's called distributed leadership. It's, all of it is necessary to make change. And so it's good to think about that. I always tell people nothing's too small, nothing's too big. Okay? But one of the ways you can say to yourself, well, how can I notice? Like, you know, how can I, if I'm Tanya, but how can I notice if, you know, there are some identities that I should be thinking about that are different when I'm trying to do something? And so these are just, I, I shorten it to just these few things, but you can certainly find more, or I'm happy to send more slides. Um, look at the leadership at your institution, your PTA, your whatever it is, and say, do I feel confident that I am represented in some way? Now, I didn't say that I have representation, although that's good too, but do I have confidence I'm represented? My perspective, my needs are being talked about or seen or being represented. Um, and so if you see, uh, say no, then you know, there's some conversation. If you say, oh yeah, my, it, it's totally represented, that means you now have to start paying attention and noticing who in the room might not be having that perspective represented. And literally, when I am doing things, I, I have paper and a pen, and I'm writing it down. Um, I can make a mistake. I can mess up. And it won't impact the future of everyone that's like me. All right? Now, if you can say that, and we see that a lot, right? Um, then great. But that means there's something you need to notice. All right? So the, the use of each of these, I'm not going to go through all of them, and there's actually more than these. It's not so much that you're looking, if, if you say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, my culture is not respected, well, you already know that probably, but it's good to know, and, this, and you can think about, well, let me see if there's any way we can make sure we communicate. But if the answer is, oh yeah, I think it's respected and valued, then that means there's something you need to notice. It's very rare, even if everybody, this is a, an example I give, even if everybody in the room was the same gender and the same race, I just picked those two. Right. There's still a lot of things you have to notice. 
right? You have to ask yourself or have a conversation and say, what are we, I'm feeling pretty confident that this thing we're doing for women of uh, different races, but what, let's think about what we're not noticing. What, you know, like, what about people who are disabled? What about trans? What about, like, you know, who, is any, are we missing anything when we only look at that and have that discussion? You know, it will help. You'd be surprised what comes out. Um, I'm not going to belabor this, but this actually, um, the real skill around this is listening, active listening. Not just listen, but active listening. Just take in whatever you're hearing. There's often, and I, I do it, there's often a, a desire to explain why it's like that or to say, oh, yeah, yeah, but I know. It's hard for me not to do it because I like to solve things and explain them because I'm an engineer. But it's really important to just listen. If you feel you need to talk, just start writing because that usually will disrupt that and just take it in. And then at some point, there can be a discussion about what was taken in. So because I, I don't want to torture you, but I do want you to do a little bit of work around noticing something. Everyone, take a look at this very simple scenario. And then I'm going to ask you three questions. This is part of a larger activity, but we're just going to do a little snippet of it, OK? And so it's pretty simple. Uh, I'll give you a minute to look at it. And then I'll also read it out loud, because I don't want to assume anything else that I didn't notice. Okay. A businessman had just turned off the lights in the store when a man appeared and demanded money. The owner opened the cash register. The contents of the cash register were scooped up, and the man sped away. A member of the police force was notified promptly. OK. I'm going to put up the next slide that has a question. I want you to think for a little bit about whether it's true or false, there's no wiggling, it's gotta be true. This is binary, true or false. And then I want you to share with the person next to you or the three people next to you your answers, okay? So here's the first question. Same, same scenario. The man who opened the cash register was the owner. And here's the scenario in case you need to reference that. True or false, so think about that for a minute. And then you can talk to one of them. I Well, I just <laughs> 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 Okay, I'm going to interrupt, I'm so sorry. Um, I will say that it would be more torturous, it takes a minute, I would say it would be more torturous if we did the entire exercise, did you do the whole thing by yourself without talking to anyone? And then you compare all of your answers, and it gets really loud in the room. But um, I just wanted to give you a taste. So, all right, so the man who opened the cash register was the owner. How many people think this is true? OK. How many people think it's false? OK. Um, for the people who think it's, I don't know, uh, true, why do you think it's true? Just anyone. It's not a test. It's OK. Yeah. The sentence says the owner opened a cash register. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, anyone else that thought it was true? Just curious? Just curious. I think just because that person is the only person that's really referenced, mm -hmm. I don't see any other people there. Okay. This, yeah. it's, right, so as yeah. far as you can tell with what you've been given, mm -hmm. that's what you think it is. Okay, so the people who think it's false, why do you think it's false? I don't know if this makes it false, but it makes a presumption that the owner is a man. So mm -hmm. we don't know the owner is a male, mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. like a businessman mm -hmm. is that. But so we, it's kind of like an assumption to say, and so that could be wrong if it was. Okay. Okay. Yes. Anyone else had something different from the false group? No, they're like, ooh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can see all your faces. It's great. I wish I had a camera. <laughs> so actually, 
It is false. And it's false for that very reason. That we don't know. Oh, they high five and everything. Oh my God. Because we don't know if the owner is male or female. It just says the owner. And what happens is we may fill in, even if we don't say the owner is male or the owner is female, there's something that your brain is doing for you that you were unaware of so that later you can use it to solve some problem, which is the question I gave you. And those assumptions come up. All right. That was just a starter. All right, here we go. Here's the next question. Now they're going to be like on it, right? Okay. So the following events in the story are true. Someone demanded money, a cash register was opened, and its contents were scooped up, and a man sped away. True or false? Oh, see, it got a lot quieter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's false. Yeah, talk to one another. It's important. <laughs> that, everybody has. From the story, according to the facts of the story that we have, money was the Okay. I'm going to break it up. Go get food if you want it. I'm going to break it up. This part is hard to get people to stop. Okay, so everyone have a chance to think about what it is, to share it with someone else, to work it out. Feel free to get food and move around. You don't have to sit there. So, how many people think that this is true? Wow. Okay. How many people think that it's false? Okay. So the people that are true, anybody from the true side want to say a little bit? Yep, yeah, sure. I, I feel like the, each statement can be traced back to something in the original narrative. Okay, so it can be traced to something in the original narrative. Yeah, anything else? Any other reasons for true? No? No? Okay, so you all agree. That's why you picked it. What about the false? Oh, I saw that. Well, also, I don't know. I feel like this could be an overstretch, but we just talked about how like this is one person of the story. Mm -hmm. So based on the perspective we're given, that's what we know. Mm -hmm. But this <laughs> deeper notion of truth is a little bit tricky okay. because there could have been <laughs> other perspectives. I feel like I'm maybe imagine, overthinking about it. Can you imagine what police officers go through when they're taking yeah. 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 Okay, and how many of the so folks true. that thought it was false, just, you know, tell us a little bit. Yeah. I just, I think there could be more than one cash register. I think mm -hmm. the statements made at the end of that there's just one that is mm -hmm. going to be more. Okay. All right. Well, the answer to this particular question happens to be true. Oh, everybody's like, darn. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Okay? Um, it, 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 it has the properties, all of the pieces of it, of something I like to say or call that it's good clean data, mm -hmm. right? We don't get very much of that in our lives, so. <laughs> the following events are the truth. Someone demanded money. Hmm. Da -da -da. Someone da -da -da -da. demanded money. It didn't say a man, it didn't say a robber, because we don't know if it's a robber. You know, it didn't say any of that. Okay. A cash register was opened. The, somebody opened a cash register. So regardless of how many there were, although that, that's a good one, I hear that one a lot, a cash register was open. It did, if it had said the cash register, I'm yeah. sorry, this was crafted on purpose, sorry. Okay. Its contents were scooped up. Contents were scooped up. Right? Good, clean data. And a man sped away. Man sped away. Rarely do you get any explanation, and I've been an associate provost and now a dean, I never get the clean data in a lot of the stuff that people tell me. I have to ferret it out. But when something is actually embedded in the narrative, which was the perfect explanation, I'm gonna use that exact wording next time, then you know for sure that it's true. Anything else 
your brain, if it's functioning well and there's no damage or anything like that, you know, maybe from an injury or something, its job is to help you make sense with incomplete data. So it's doing its job helping you figure out what to fill in. Okay, so I have one more. This is the last one. So, while the cash register contained money, the story doesn't state how much. True or false? Think about your answer and then talk to one another. So now people are crafty, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, it died on me. I prefer the Mac. It's been real. I'll see you tomorrow, Friday. Yeah. Right, nice. What time's your train? Or are you taking a train? <laughs> Bye. I'll take care of you soon. You too. Bye, Lee. Okay. Bye. Okay. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. <laughs> Laura, I know, you do, you want to be right, yeah. You know, I will say, in the actual exercise, which takes about 20 minutes to half an hour to do some additional stuff, there are 11 questions, and only a few of them are a certain answer. And as soon as I say that, everybody starts counting on their sheets to see. So you don't, you don't have to go through all of that today, I'll just give you that. All right, while the cash register contained money, the story does not state how much. True or false? False. False. How many people think false? Ooh. Hmm. How many people think true? Okay. I, I think it's neither. It's ah, you've got to pick one. You don't have a choice. No, it's just unsubstantiated. I know, I understand. That doesn't make it false. I understand, but your brain doesn't understand. <laughs> the physiology of your brain picks one, it's binary. Okay, but I hear you talking. I hear you talking. So why do you think it's false? Since not well, you are not saying false. I mean, <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it, I think it's true. It doesn't quantify in this. It doesn't quantify, but it says the contents. Right. Okay. So you think it's true. All right. And why do you think it's false? The false folks. Uh, yeah. The first part of the statement is false mm -hmm. yeah. because it doesn't ever say that the cash register contains money. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I saw your hand up in the back. Oh yeah, I mean, that was contained. That's always my answer, actually. Hershey that, kisses. No, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a jury head, so it's got to be jury. So the answer to this is false. And why is it false? It's because you don't know what the contents are, but also. Also, you called it a case register. register. <laughs> oh, did I have a typo? I'm sorry. Oh. I was typing really fast. I'm so sorry. I just. It was really late. It was really late when I did this, but I will fix that. Thank you. Thank you, the cash register. Is also that all the parts that are important in this question we don't have good clean data for it. So always you want it as much as possible, and most of the time you will not have it. You want to look to see if there's any part of what you're using to come up with an answer or an idea or an action that they have some good, it can be substantiated, I like that word, in some way. And the purpose, so I'm not gonna make you do another one. So what, what's your takeaway from this? Just what are your thoughts now, besides the fact that I was tricking you or you feel like I was tricking you, I really wasn't. Um, I mean, you know, what surprised you about this? Anything? What did you notice about this activity? Yeah? Uh, I think we make a lot of assumptions. Okay, we make a lot of assumptions, yeah. Probably more than we realize. Yeah, anything else? Yes? Yeah. Um, that each time you become more careful in reading, uh, the first time mm -hmm. is kind of fairly quickly. Yeah. And by the second time you know, you have to pay attention. Right. And by the third time it gets even more confusing. Right. So over time, and it doesn't happen this quickly, 
you will gain fluency in noticing things that normally you wouldn't notice. So anything else? Anything else that? Did anyone change their answer from what they originally started with when you started talking? Yes. Yeah? Tell me about that. So I was going to say I took away you have to um, check your first assumption. Because right away I was like, false, true. Uh, <laughs> She's like, I got the answer. Yeah. Go back. <laughs> exactly. Go back and look at it again a little deeper. Mm -hmm. any, any, other, any other comments? I don't want to miss anyone. So this exercise, why I tortured you with what was a mini version of this exercise, is to save me 10 slides trying to convince you that one, you okay? That one, all right, okay now. <laughs> that one, without us knowing it, our brains, if they're healthy, are doing what they're supposed to do, which is fill in the blanks for us so we can take some action. So that's good. Good brain, right? Good. Also that we do make assumptions that with more information, especially if we can see some of it as good, clean data information, we might come to a different conclusion. <coughs> so that's the flexibility, being open to more information. And that also that the second time and third time with practice, you can almost read, I can read proposals now from departments, all kinds of stuff for the most part, and I can tell the stuff that's just, you know, I would have to assume, right. And then what I do is I underline it and I get clarification from it. So when I'm making decisions, that's how I actually operationalize this. But I wanted you to do this exercise so that you would get a feel for how much, how important it is to notice as much as possible, to question as much as possible, to be in, as inquisitive. I use that word deliberately. I didn't say curiosity. Oh, I'm curious about that. No, I'm inquisitive. I have to, I'm going to have to, you know, really find out what, what the information is. And then also that working with other people and thinking with other people can sometimes yield a more complete and accurate, you know. So this is important. This, this kind of noticing is what I almost never see when I have a group of people together and we have to work through something. And in my case, it's always something tense it seems when they come in my office. But, um, so, any questions? Any? Yes? Can you speak more about how you operationalize it? Yes. Um, so, for example, when, I, when I'm teaching, uh, I actually keep a journal, too, so believe it or not, that helps. Like, I have a journal for my administrative work and a journal for when I teach. And I just, after I have a meeting, not every meeting, but I have to have a meeting where there's a department that's going to implode and we're trying to like figure out how to not let that happen. Um, so that was a very ugly meeting, <laughs> not fun. But afterwards, I write down all the things that I notice. I try not to write too much during the imploding department meeting. Um, and see, is there something that I'm noticing? And what do I think I might not be noticing? So the stuff I've noticed, I'm like, what do, do I really know what I think I know about these things? And if I don't, then I will go back and talk to the chair or whoever. I'll get more information. Um, and I assume that there's stuff that I didn't notice. So assume all the time that there is something, not just one thing, there's probably a lot of things that you haven't noticed. And I found with that that even when um, someone, like I have a faculty come in and they're upset because, because I didn't give them money or something, I don't know. But they're upset about something, and they're being really, you know, they're, they're acting out <laughs> in a way they should not be, you know, and I handle that, and then I send them on their way, but I just say, well, what did I notice and what didn't I notice? And I realize that, you know, maybe I should, I don't, I'm better at this now, by the way. <laughs> maybe I should have actually spent a little time talking to him, not just about the thing he wanted, but just about, what's happening in your department right now, how are things going, tell me what, a little more finding out, just seeing if anything pops up, because once they start talking about something unrelated, they start spilling like all this other stuff, that I'm like, whoa, okay, if I had known that, that would make this very different. And so I find that I, and it also helps me, because certain people are harder to deal with than others, I mean, you know. For whatever reason, when I'm going to, maybe it's, it could be me. Sometimes is a reason, actually. And actually, it probably is. So I'm just going to do that. And I know that when I'm going to meet with them, that as hard as I try, my brain is like, okay, 
get ready. You know, you know what I mean? I know that it's going to sound different to me coming from them than it will coming from someone else. And so I remind myself to just be as aware as possible, be flexible, 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 and don't make any decisions now, which I try not to do anyway. I try never to make decisions in the moment. Um, unless it's, you know, jump from the front of that car or something like that, you know. But other than that, I just put off the final decision until I've had a moment to think. So I use it to make sure I'm noticing not just them, but me as well. I didn't talk as much, and I won't today because of the time, about mindfulness and how you pay attention to you, because you can find this everywhere. I mean, you can research this easily, and so, you know, I'm not going to do that today. But if we were going to be together for the whole morning, we could do a little bit of work on both sides of mindfulness and then show how to bring them together. But as much as possible, you want to be flexible, question yourself um, about what you know or think you know and what might be missing, and then just be inquisitive and ask. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes it's something that has absolutely nothing to do with what the meeting is even about. You know? And they don't have the skill set necessarily that you have in being able to think this way. OK, so bias, there's this myth. I used to actually say it almost exactly like this. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not biased. I treat everybody the same. No, no, no. I love everybody. Everybody's valuable equally. I used to do that. Uh, the reality is if you have a brain and it's functioning the way it should, you are biased. Bias is a good thing. It means you're healthy. So actually, you know, sometimes, and I might put it on the beginning of this talk, I don't know, people will say minimize unconscious bias, which is really difficult to do and it's not being measured well anyway. So, you know, the studies aren't doing a good job. But I'm not trying to minimize, even though I love doing that as an engineer. All I'm trying to do is not make a mistake based on the filter. And that's called a cognitive error. So, you know, I assume all people who wear stripes are just, oh, there's a lot of stripes in here. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Well, all people who wear stripes are, you know, they're kind of a little flaky. They don't know. They can't focus. That's the problem. If they could just focus more, it would be better. Like, if I did that, and it's not like I thought about it consciously, but I'm meeting somebody with stripes or with stripes. And uh, my brain has already done some filtering for me. I filled in some of those blanks, like the cash register. So, you know, know that your brain does this. It's good to know where, what you're filtering. It's good to know for particular identities what associations you're making. And there are some ways to test that. Some of that is a little contested, but it's all we have right now. And it's, it, it's good enough for you to work with it. And I'll show you that in a minute. So there are things that would intensify the filter, make it take it to the next level, right? I don't care if I even see a smidgen of a stripe. Oh, it looks like there's a stripe on her earring. OK, that's it. That's it. Like it intensifies it, right? And all of these things, some of them are identity, things you can see, like I have dark skin, I'm African American. Uh, time, you're being rushed to make a decision. Sometimes search committees do that, and I just slow them right down. Cognitive overload, you're trying to think about and pull together too many pieces at once. None of these things ever happen to any of you, I know that. Stress, multitasking, fatigue, never happens. Ambiguity and accountability. So ambiguity is when it's not clear what the process or procedure is, so we're gonna figure out what, we're just gonna come up with something, right? And that's going to be driven by the filtering and the group or the individual. And accountability, nobody's watching, nobody cares. So we might as well just go ahead and do it this way. That's how these play out. And then worldview is just your, your cultural upbringing. And in academia, the culture of your discipline or your department or your institution. And if any of those things, and I'll give you an example, intersect, it intensifies filtering. So for example, anybody here in physics? Good, okay, so, um, no it's not bad, but I always like to check just in case. So in physics, which was, I thought gonna be my major in undergrad, so I took a ton of physics, I loved it. Um, the way you, you can always tell when you're at a physics conference, because there's a uniform, right? And it's mostly jeans with a certain kind of top and buttons, not like a polo top or anything. And you usually have a bag of some kind, usually a backpack, and then you have some kind of shoes, but they can't be new. 
And, you know, there's a lot of beards if they're men, you know, there's a lot of the hair not really being if it's women, you know, that kind of thing. And the way you hold your body is a particular way, and the way you use language is very linear. There's no branching and doing it. Very, I can tell in a second. You can just take a blindfold off, copy physics, MBA, what, I mean, you can tell across disciplines, every discipline out here, what you're studying right now, it has a uniform, it has a way to use its language, it has a way that you use your body, and a lot of other things that the discipline has made assumptions about what that means. And so if I come in, and I'm talking the way I do, which is definitely not linear, <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm suited, I'm in a suit, or at least just, I'm wearing this, it's not even a real suit, like I'm wearing this, and I show up, they're gonna be like, she can't possibly know what she's doing. She can't possibly be a physicist. I see this happen all the time in searches, in search committees. And so, and so also you need to keep in mind, so if you're in a department, if you're faculty or a student, or both, you need to talk about the culture of your discipline, the culture of this institution, and the culture of your school, and really be, um, as honest as possible and see where the intersections are. Because when you are evaluating other people, whether it's grading their papers or things like that, you're not doing it, but your brain has already set up these filters for you to make things easier, for you to work with incomplete information. It's doing its job. But if you don't know what those things are, you don't know what to take a moment to pause and say, well, I know that when language is used a certain way, if we don't hear it in that way, we make assumptions, let's have a discussion about that. We can't just eliminate this candidate because it seemed like, you know, she was branching out or, you know, whatever. You know? And I've heard just those things. Oh, I don't know, the way she was dressed, I don't know. It just doesn't look like she'll fit in, you know, that kind of thing. That's where that comes from. But people don't realize that's what's happening. And, you know, you want to be the driver of your own ship, so to speak. So there is something called the implicit association test. I forgot to put the URL. How many people have heard about it? Oh, okay. Just go, you know, Harvard, implicit, whatever, it'll come up. It's, uh, when they first came out, I remember there were two. I think race and gender. And I was a grad student, and I was a computer scientist, and I was like, let me go over here to Harvard, which I did. <laughs> I need to see the algorithms they're using for this, because this is like, how is this gonna tell me anything? So I, you know, wrote email, went over, looked at everything, and I had to say, hmm, this would be hard to pull because it has to do with an association you make with an idea. So I show you an image of, so I'll give you an example around gender. They'll say, um, I think it'll say uh, hit Y or K, whatever the letter is, if these two things are something in common, hit the other letter if they're not, right? So yes or no, true or false, like that true or false. And so there's a picture of a woman and then there's physicists. And you have to quickly like, pick one or the other. So it, it's working on a time scale that a human cannot, you can't take like a second and go, oh, I'm gonna do that too late, it will not count that score. It has to be within a certain timing for it to be automatic. And so it'll keep giving you more associations until it has enough to be able to run the algorithm. And so, you know, it's not perfect, but there have been enough studies that have either investigated it, tried to validate it, or made use that it's useful, okay? So it's important to take that. I will say be kind to yourself if the results are not what you expected. I was completely devastated by my results. They have a lot of different identity dimensions now. There's gotta be like 10 at least, maybe more. So, you know, you can like get into doing all of them like Netflix, you know, you finish one, you keep going. But, you know, it's good to know what they are and you don't ever have to tell anybody whether it's negative or positive association, you just need to know. Because if you know what it is, then there's some things you can do. Oh, sorry, gotta have a control diagram. There are some things that you can do in a mindful way to make use of that information. It's good data, I don't know how clean it is, but it's pretty good, okay? And so you can ask yourself, especially when you're teaching or doing something where it's a longer period of time, who am I including? The, you, know, you can ask yourself some of these, and you can ask yourself, what am I signaling by things like what's in the room, et cetera. 
But going deeper into a state of really focused mindfulness, you want to know why. Why am I doing it? And this is where you think about, is it you know, my discipline? Is it my upbringing? It's not. It's important to know. You don't have to share it with anyone. But when you know it, this is part of you gain, gaining fluency and just being aware more quickly. How much time do I have? Is it up? No. OK. So time is up. And I will quickly, we're at the end. There's a worksheet. I can make these slides available. There's a worksheet I developed that will help you ignore the micro messaging stuff because we didn't include that in the talk. That you know, if you've identified a kind of bias, like I have a bias for students to communicate using a certain geometry in a certain way because it's comfortable for me, and so I know that, and so I try to intentionally make sure that I'm paying attention in the same way. You know, I can be intentional in what I do. So this will help you. And there are some strategies here in the last few slides that the only thing I will tell you, don't try to do them all, because everybody goes, oh my god, there's so many. Just pick one. Pick one and try it for a period of time. Just pick it. All right? What if you spent the whole day being flexible about your assumptions? Even if somebody cut you off when you were like driving, if you were being flexible about what you assumed, because we all know what you assume. What an idiot, that's the assumption. But what if you said, I'm going to be, okay, I got that out. What if I'm now flexible? What else might be going on? Just to practice. So just pick one, and there's a number of them. Right, this one should be, everybody should do this anyway. Remain resilient. There are actually, there's work on practices of resilience, how to increase your resilience, especially around these things. So when something doesn't go as planned and engagement, you don't go, oh, I can, you can get, get back in there, right? That's actually as important to the work as understanding what's going on. Um, and then last, but not least, I always um, tell my students this, because this is an education uh, class, impact is so much more important than intent. So if, you know, I've said something which I have without even knowing it, to somebody working for me, and it was in a way offensive or hurtful to her, which she, let me know through the process that we had worked out. And I didn't go, oh, I didn't mean that. What I meant was, no, 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 it doesn't matter what I meant. It had that impact. So what I need to do is listen and learn, and then maybe with her or without her, talk about what I'm going to try to do different next time, what we can do if you notice I don't, you know, that kind of stuff. So you can actually do that. that just that simple thing will go so far and changing the way you're able to engage with people and who you're willing to take the risk to engage with. So I'll leave it at that. And you can work. I'm sorry I ran out of time. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Yes, that's I wanted to make sure that there was at least a room for a few questions. There's no clock in here. I usually have a clock and I can go faster. Any questions, comments? Insights? They're like, ooh, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. uh, years ago, I had a, a friend who studied teacher effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And um, when we talked about the mistakes that, that teachers are likely to make, she mentioned one that, that startled me, and I still remember it decades later. Oh, she what said, is it? Teachers tend to give more time to students they perceive as good students to answer a question than they give to students who they perceive as not good students. Right. So and really you know who, to, to who do you perceive that. as a good, that's important, to give yourself time. So most of us think a good student, I know I do this, and I you know, count. Um, who somehow reminds you of yourself. <laughs> they don't have to look like you, but there's just something about them. You're like, oh, they just remind me of my I, I was just like that. And, and it really, it's, and so you don't realize, we didn't talk about micro messaging and micro inequities and affirmations, but you don't realize how your whole physical being, that's why you can never be neutral, is expressing all these different things, including that, but you're right. Usually what we think is a good student is one that reminds us of ourselves. So much that someone who really is a good student might not even be perceived that way. And there have been studies in that. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Or yes? Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. I really 
really appreciated a lot of what you shared, and I really, especially how you, how you shared about how you operationalize mm -hmm. um, kind of some of that exercise we went through in your own work. Um, but obviously, say at a, a meeting in a university, <laughs> not everyone at the table has the same amount of power. <laughs> That's true. And That's I'm wondering right. if you can talk about if you're somebody with a relatively small amount of power mm -hmm. compared to the people at the yeah. table, how you would still promote ideas like this mm -hmm. when you may not have the strongest. Voice. That's an excellent, yeah. excellent question. And so one of the things that, because um, people will come to me and say, after they've taken the workshop and they're going back to their departments, they're like, oh, oh, the chair, but I knew I'm not tenured. What do I do? Yeah, yeah, that whole thing, right? And I talk to them about leading upwards and some of the things, techniques you can do around that. Sometimes that means you go to whoever the next person is. Sometimes it means no. You go to someone even in another department who, is more senior or whatever the word is and talk to them about it and get their insights on how you can bring that in your own but um, unless you just have a relationship with the very top you don't have to jump over anybody and in some institutions hierarchy is everything and that would be bad anyway but you want to figure out a way to lead upwards and so what I do I did this with my provost who I could actually talk to but I don't think he was always listening actively. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, yeah. Um, is I would say, oh, there's this great article I read. It's really interesting. It's about how African American women who um, are supervised by white males in academic institutions, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. There is an article like that, right? And so I said, I think it would be, you know, why don't you take a look at it and maybe we can talk about it for a few minutes sometimes. I'd love to. And then I give it to him. And you know, he did read it, because I keep asking him, finally he's like, I'm gonna have to read this thing. So he reads it, and then we end up having a really good conversation and setting some ground rules, which is great. Um, so sometimes you can do it in different ways, that's one way. But um, just you know, leading upwards, and there's a lot of literature on techniques you can use for that, is one way to do it. Because as you do that, then that person, who may be better positioned, because the positionality is important, can, maybe take that on. You don't, you're right, the person who doesn't have the power doesn't have to take it on directly. And also, it's my other famous and favorite saying, never let them see you coming, <laughs> ever. Do not let them see you coming. And that's a way, just, you're in there and they never saw you even coming, right? So that's one way to do that, is by leaving them up this. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. What Any other? One more, one more, oh, yes. Um, so you're talking about kind of the way you operationalize mindfulness yeah. in your work, and I was wondering when you kind of, I guess, give workshops to leaders. Um, yeah. If you ever get, I guess maybe push back, like mm -hmm. I don't have time for this. And I was thinking in particular, you know, the example or the exercise that we did ended with a police report. So, um, like I know in their work, they often say they have to use their best judgment. Yep. And make assumptions, and I imagine that like leaders, even in universities, also have to um, use their best judgment and yep. make assumptions based on either data or um, you know generalizations. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just speak to kind of how you help yeah. leaders think through times when sure. they feel they they don't have time to mm -hmm. be mindful in their work and Ooh. instead have mm -hmm. to. Um, yeah. You make assumptions or use generalizations or use um, data, stereotypes, mm -hmm. whatever, to make decisions. Okay, good. And so most of the workshops I do are with presidents, cabinets, and trustees. And they used to be with other groups, but I, I don't have the bandwidth. Um, I also did uh, a lot of work with the police department at Wellesley College. So they had the whole mindfulness thing. And for, uh, I will say for, emergency service workers, police, for hospital, people that have to sometimes just respond because you know, you're know you gushing blood or something or whatever, you know, that that's the toughest situation to be in and, and do this. And you know, they did figure out a way to do it and also part of that involved a way to be resilient and connect, be transparent afterward. But that's a separate discussion. But around the leaders, um, I get that all the time. 
I mean, they're like, oh, you know, we don't have time for this or whatever. And usually they have booked the time to spend to do it. Um, and they'll say something like, oh, I have too much or whatever. I said, you know, it, one of the most important qualities of good leadership, and I may clean up the language a little, you know, is um, not so much making, your, making the best judgment you can with what you have, because that can get you in trouble, because how do you know that what you have is a bowl of stuff you should be even looking at, but to do your due diligence to make sure that of all the data available to you, what you decided to focus on is the right data. All right? And that's hard to do too, but if you're intentional about it, you have more of the correct data in the bowl than not. Often you see leaders that, um, usually it exhibits someone who does what you describe is exhibited as somebody who's very reactionary. That's when you see people reacting to things. Because they're just, they're just, um, they're, they're not necessarily doing their due diligence and getting the information they need. And for any leader, like somebody who's in a real leadership position, let's say something happened on campus, which did on my campus about uh, two Fridays ago, um, that I had to deal with. And, you know, I could have right away just jumped out there and said, oh, but the fact is, I didn't have all the data I needed. But for any leader, including you all, and in any institution, the institution has values and it always has invariance. It has things that are true no matter what else is swirling around. We value every member of this campus might be one. We believe in an education that prepares people to go out into a global world. I'm making these up, but that might, let's say those were the two. So if something happened and I had to do something, which the most of which would be make sure everyone's safe, that's an invariant, right, because you're taken care of, and also putting out a statement, I can say what I know is invariant and then say we are now um, doing our diligence to get all the information together so that we can make a determination of what the next steps would be that would serve this community better. That's a good leader. Someone who just, you know, does, that just jumps, um, well, they're, a they're in a leadership position, but they're not behaving as a leader. I mean, they're not. <laughs> so. Well, I want to thank uh, yeah. all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lucky to have her, and we were lucky to get a little piece uh, <laughs> of your insights. And I like how you said, you know, I can only focus on those groups, and you're making people mm -hmm. like trustees. and. We don't even think about them as part of this whole universe, They're realizing that, I mean, many, many constituents are part of this equation who need to understand an impact on how leadership and diversity yeah. and inclusivity gets enacted. Thank you again. Okay, thank you for coming. I appreciate it.